brothers, sisters, colleagues, Sujeta Ji, Shadesh Ji, my one of our old associates. Uh, I remember Sujeta is one of the uh, prime sources of inspiration because she has been knowing me much the, since perhaps uh, late 90s and early 2000s. I have been knowing her since 1991-92. It's all Harshad Mehta's camp, which was busted because of her. And immediately after that, I landed up in the CBI. And the rich journalism she did, and the book she wrote, that was indeed, it was a beacon for us cops who weren't really aware of the technicalities of the stock market, which she had so intelligent, in a very intelligible manner explained to all of us. So I think uh, this is where our struggle started. And uh, as it is, uh, you, sorry, I'll just put it off. And immediately after that, the type of knowledge which I gained consequent upon the exposing of the stock market scam. Started all by Sukheta, then followed us, followed up by we all through the statutory mechanism of registration of FIR grades, such as arrest, chashi, trial, all these things we were doing. And in that process, uh, the knowledge which we gained, we tried to uh, put that knowledge in a very effective manner at uh, various places. And this is where a person gets into doldrums. Well, this is just not very linked to today's lecture. But since Sucheta had uh, put forward this point, I thought it is better to elaborate. And uh, based on that, we also did, and Sucheta is going ahead, why should we be far behind? So we decided to ourselves expose some more scams, which was indeed very tough. Uh, from the CBI domain, we were the first ones after that to have raided the semi guys who had really turned arrogant with their newly found uh, statutory powers, which they were not used to. We did the MS shoe scam during those days. Thereafter, we did the Reliance private placement. Then we did the Panna Mukta oil fields being given to Reliance and Ron combined. Some of these cases are mentioned in that book, Polyester Prince, written by an Australian journalist. But then, if so long as you are doing good things, which suits the convenience of the bosses, they will pat you on the back saying, oh, your good work is bringing laurels not only to us, but to our organization. But the moment, People at the helm of affairs, the rich and the powerful, they start uh, putting on extraneous pressures on those very people who have been commending you for all your work. A dichotomy sets in and your benefactors certainly, suddenly start turning against you. And this is unfortunately what happened to me. My glimpses were just a mirage. When I got appreciation from my bosses, I thought, oh, I'm doing, they are really sincere about it. But when they said, okay, now start scuttling those major cases which were exposed, and I said, no. At that time, we were shown the door. I got to know that my innings in the government service, service wouldn't last for very long. I was dumped in the State Reserve Police Force at 136-acre campus in Goregaon, practically doing very little work, not much of work, just housekeeping work to maintain the cops and something like a manpower supplier. You have to maintain them well and when the police in the local domain, they require forces, you just supply them. But then I took this opportunity. There was, I found a silver lining to that. So number one, of course, we experimented on how to make major good, how to do good construction at negligible cost. That time when the DSR, that is called the District Schedule 
of rates of PWD was around 800 to 900 rupees a square feet. We were doing construction at the rate of 150 rupees a square feet. Anyway, so, but then we got into trouble and uh, I wrote a book exposing the cops. This was not liked by the superiors. And then we had a meeting in Sucheta's house. Shalesh was there. And at that time, Shalesh always, his mind is working on getting some novel idea. He's very innovative in ideas. And when I said that there were some police transfers happening at the written recommendations of the ministers, he was taken aback. And then the RTI would follow. I still remember 413 of the Bombay Police Manual. And that is where a set of dynamic activists were born and this is how it all started and money life as we are seeing I keep on following the mails I keep on reading the newsletters and the one first things in the morning is to see what scam is being exposed and which will certainly enlighten us now we come to the main topic perhaps what I spoke may have been off point but then it is very relevant the fact remains that just as in the case, in the sensitive cases, the cops and the seniors, they have a discretion whether to go ahead with the case or not to go ahead with the case. Because law is, I would call it, law is something neutral to multiple interpretations. Law is supposed to be objective. There cannot be two interpretations of the law, otherwise there can be no equality. So the fundamental basis, now before we go on to 66A, let us understand what should be the primary attribute of a law. There are just three, four lines written in the Constitution of India, which is the most, these are the most important lines, not just in India, but in every liberal constitution of the world. Because it narrates little, but the implications are unlimited and enormously diverse, which perhaps is endless and won't really, it will not be very exhaustive also, but still there are many of them. Article 14 of the Constitution of India, as per a democratic system, all laws have to be consistent with the Constitution. If they aren't, the laws are declared as unconstitutional and illegal ultra virus of the Constitution of India. Now, Article 14 of the Constitution of India says, it talks of equality before law. The state shall not deny to any person equality before the law or the equal protection of the laws within the territory of India. Now, these are the lines where it says that the laws have to be applied equally and there has to be an equal protection of laws. Something very simple, just two lines. But this is where the entire philosophy of administrative law emanates. Administrative law is that law which is required to be followed by government agencies, by statutory agencies, agencies which are required to implement the law. And the fundamental attribute of this comes from that. Now, what are these fundamental attributes? Now, the interpretation says that if there is a law which can be interpreted by different people at different times in a different manner, there cannot be any equality before the law. Law is the same. One guy says a case is made out. I say during investigation against say, Reliance, case is made out. My boss says case is not made out. His boss says case is made out. Then there is a politician who is making a recommendation and he tells my super boss case is not made out. And he says case is not made out, case is closed. Now this is not law. This is where it violates the constitution of India. For any law to be sustainable, it has to be objective. Objective in the sense that the inference has to come out with a mathematical certainty. Now, 66A of the Constitution of India 
Oh, sorry, 66A of the Information Technology Act, which talks of certain abusive, sending certain abusive or objectionable information through the net, through the internet, telephone, cell phone. Now, for that, this is regarded as an offense. Now, the words in 66A are so loosely worded that some people, for a typical case, they say an offense is made up, the others would say offense is not made up. Now, before I go ahead, now let us see the ground reality which exists in the police. Now, most of the police station guys, number one, are very ill-equipped with law. They wouldn't be knowing anything about the constitution of India. They only superficially know certain ingredients of a particular section and blindly apply them according to their whims and fancies. Now, in police there is a saying, often when we work at the ground level, we talk of certain law and certain logic and which is not palatable to the superior. He says, you show me the rule, sorry, I'll say again, you show me the face, I'll show you the rule. Now, I am seeing your face, should I show a rule which affects you, better do it. Now, this is what it says, that means a law, you see a face and then you apply the law according to your convenience. Now, at, now, this is slightly at a refined level, these are the things, but a corollary to this proposition is prevalent among the juniors, which say, Pele action, Badme section. You know? Now, now, this is a corollary to that. You show me the face, show me the roof. Now, Pele action, Badme section. That means first stop the guy in the lockup. If you want, if things are fine, hammer him torture him or whatever you want to do and then after everything is over now okay how do we make the papers and what sections to impose now we see the Palgar case in this perspective this exactly seems to have happened because in police law and maintaining law and order is considered to be extremely sacrosanct because if there is an infringement to any legal in any the law and order situation, the superiors are unsparing because it has got political implications. So they clearly say, we want law and order to be maintained. <coughs> now, if we see other realities at the ground level in the police, because it's a very complicated set of uh, social, e socio-economic dynamics which prevail at the police station level. Because any person having wielding statutory powers, a certain draconian powers, he is posted there not because of merit. Some of them may be posted, not say all, but an overwhelming percentage of people in the police who occupy sensitive positions, they are the ones who are there either because of some reciprocal arrangements with a powerful guy or by buying the posting. Earlier it used to be buying of the posting, now buying and the posting and reciprocal arrangements, both are at play. Now among the cops there is a feeling that it is better not to get a posting free of cost or on merit because that comes out to be pretty expensive. Why it's expensive? Because if you don't pay for a posting, you have to work with a lot of fear. Oh, what if I get caught? My superior is going to do an inquiry against me. What if any innocent person like you all, they are harassed by the cops and you lodge a complaint against that corrupt guy. And if the complaint is lodged against the corrupt guy, who is going to protect me? Certainly, if I have got posting on the basis of merit, nobody is going to protect me. But at the same time, if I buy the posting, the person to whom I have paid the money, he is ethically, morally, whatever you may say, he is bound to protect him when he is in distress. So the calculation is made this way. 
okay, if by not buying a posting, getting a posting on merit, say um, a reasonable level of police station, say Palgar or something, or any A grade police station like Juhu, he says, if by not buying a posting, uh, my calculation today would be around the top guy in the police would be earning about 2, 3, 4 lakh a month. But if he buys the posting, he can have all the illicit joints working openly in the vicinity. As we see the raids being done by Dhoble and all. That's just a tip of the iceberg. Wherever you go, you see in the evenings, full of ladies buzz all, all around. You move around and from outside you can make out that all these ladies buzz are working. So according to me, a reasonable sized police station, if he has the blessing of the superiors, if he is earning 4 lakh a month without pay, he would be earning at least 20 to 25 lakh a month by buying your posting. And for that, how much he has to pay? Maximum he have to pay is 50 lakh or 1 crore or something. 50 lakh, 60 lakh. Now if that is the dynamics, now this, this is really because this is an industry. Wise are the ones who treat industry as the way there is an income and there is an expense. A guy who thinks only of income, he is not a businessman. Then he is not in this corruption industry. So he talk, thinks of income and he thinks of the expenditure. Expenditure is buying the posting, settling certain issues which may be detrimental to his career. Somebody complains, okay, he gives his, meets his boss, he says, Nain, upar ke saath ka then he will go there and he says, okay, pay me 20 lakhs or something, I will dump the case. Now these are the expenses. Now what happens is that this level of immunity exists amongst the cops who hold position at the senior levels. Now, Thane rural area in the police is regarded as one of the most lucrative areas because there are lots of illegal activities happening there. Land grabbing, coastal regulations, zone violations, mangrove destruction, illegal transport of chemicals not allowed, adulteration of uh, petrol with naphtha. There are, uh, there are several, several, many, many activities. These are all very lucrative coastal areas. And the boss sits in Thane. He is called the Thane Rural SP. Because he is called Thane Rural because under the Code of Criminal Procedure, in a city where there is a commissioner appointed, the residual rural area outside the city, that is the superintendent of police. He works the conventional way. So within Thane area and its satellite towns, that is the commissioner, but other places in the district, these are the uh, these are the conventional areas where the magisterial power is with the sub regional magistrates, slightly complicated. Now, this is a sensitive police station. But then, the rule of hierarchical cooperation will doesn't work when there is a violation of when there is a when there is undermining of law and order. Because law and order is something which no superior officer is ever going to tolerate. And at that moment, when Thakre uh, thing happened, Facebook posts and all, so there was some sort of a dynamics which was going on. Now, the guy had to maintain law and order to save his posting. Shiv Sena guys were threatening, we will take law in our own hands, we are going to uh, affair. We are going to break the law and order. So the guy thought, the police station in charge thought, okay, let me come out with a solution. So then the negotiation started what to do. The Sena guys clearly said, we want these two girls behind bars. Nothing doing. We want them to be, go behind bars. So then they said, okay, we'll put them behind bars and uh, they were arrested in the night. Later on, when they found that under section 46 of the Code of Criminal Procedure, you can't arrest a lady in the night. She was sent back and then arrested again in the morning. So technically, the moment a person's freedom is restrained, he is considered to be under arrest. And all the civil rights which are specific to arrest start accruing at that very moment. But generally here, uh, some sort of a 
um, some sort of a disinformation or misinformation has been spread which says arrest happens when you are formally arrested. So then there was an accommodation case. They said, okay, we'll apply sections on these women, these girls, put them behind bars and about the writing section they said we will go slow and accordingly an accord was arrived at and consequent upon that accord it was imperative for them to find some sort of a section and accordingly those sections were applied on the basis of a negotiation. Now the constitution of India, article 14 of the constitution of India nowhere contemplates such an application of uh, law where a law has to be applied on the basis of expediency on the basis of local negotiation now this could be an isolated case but for us all it's a great we need to get into a grim contemplation because when laws can be applied differently if there is a discretion in the application of laws, then how does the civil liberties of an individual sustain? Now, that's a critical question. Well, if a statutory authority decides not to take any action. Now, for instance, you may come out with an overwhelming evidence against a politician, which is just absolutely so like any prudent person would say he is guilty, yet he say he denies it. He denies it, the newspapers would carry the denial and uh, many of us, uh, and the matter gets over there. Unless until it is pursued in uh, the statutory domains there again, the result whether it happened or not, that's very tedious and time consuming. Now, considering this, if we go by the certain statistics on cyber crimes before I go ahead. Cyber crime is a rather nascent law. It was enacted in the year 2000. But then it was, it took time for people to get to know the law. Because for anything for the society, it was, there are only certain exceptions where people got to know very fast the law, like Sucheta and Mr. Salish Gandhi, they and many others propagated the RTI. Mr. Kegel Simlani was, is no longer with us. He was one of the very active proponents. And RTI law was imbibed and it was used in a very wide manner and also by a lot of support given by the press. Everybody got to know about the RTI. But IT Act, it took several years for the people to know what exactly was the Information Technology Act. Gradually, when the cyber crime cells came up and certain misuse of laws started happening widely on the internet, a lot of people were in anguish because of the abusive behavior of certain people consistently being propagated through the net, that gradually people started knowing what Information Technology Act was. Now, in the year 2000, in the year 2010, uh, under the Information Technology Act, there were 966 cases registered. Now most of them were under 66A, because other technical offences pertaining to IT Act, like uh, uh, cracking of the passwords, etc., hacking of computers, we still uh, don't have that level of technical expertise to crack these cases. Now, 966 was in 2010. In 2011, it almost increased by 90%. It was 1,791 cases in the year 2011. Now, these were the cases which were registered. These are the figures given by the National Crime Records Bureau. And the people who were arrested in the year 2010, there were 288 arrests, roughly little less than 300. And it increased to 1184 in the year 2011. That is, it increased by almost four times, 400% increase in arrests. And most of these cases, almost 30% uh, uh, of these cases, 20 to 30% of these cases emanated from Maharashtra. 
so these are the figures which are there and now we can very well imagine how vulnerable we are now before i go ahead let me read the relevant part of section 66a which is prone to misuse 66a punishment for sending offensive messages to communication service etc any person who sends by means of a computer resource or a communication device i mean it's very wide connotation computer resource and a communication device which would also include your include your cell phone any information that is grossly offensive or has menacing character now grossly offensive or a menacing character who's going to judge that a cop who doesn't know much about the essential elements of civil liberties a person may find it grossly offensive other wouldn't somebody says it's offensive the other guy says he's calling spade a spade the third guy says uh, why you wrong who is wrong to now all these interpretations now this is subject to a very wide interpretation and where interpretation is wide and prone to various interpretation over the, over the same set of facts this is where not just arbitrariness comes in but also corruption sets in like for instance we have been seeing in the hit and run cases one set of people say if it's a hit and run case it's just a case of accident he had a four day two years in prison man but if he is driving rashly deliberately with passion and then he interprets no if he is driving rashly rashly he would be knowing that it may kill someone this is okay we apply 304 304 is almost 60% murder which comes to over 10 years imprisonment and the trial process is more tedious it goes to the sessions court 304a comes to the lower court now this is where media took up the matter of uh, uh, alistair pereira nuria salman khan now after taking up the media uh, these things now the police have got a massive place where to talk of money because most of the hit and run cases are done by people lot of them who are uh, driving cars and the rich guys and then say okay we give you a lighter section you will be released on bail immediately two years imprisonment you can even confess you may be given punishment of up to rising of the court or one day imprisonment you get out and you are out otherwise he say i'm going to slap the serious section he says no 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 please please don't do it sir which adjustment kariye sir which adjustment kariye and then of course a deal is struck now this is one place where again we always say that a discretion is there we have always been saying let them come out with the law on drunken driving or rash driving which clearly which doesn't leave any discussion on part of the police if it's drunken driving rash and negligent driving there's only one section he has to apply but here is what discussion now the other provision here any information which he knows to be false but for the purpose of causing annoyance inconvenience danger obstruction insult injury criminal intimidation enmity hatred or ill will persistently makes or making use of such computer resource or a communication device then c is the any electronic mail or electronic mail message for the purpose of causing annoyance or inconvenience or to deceive or to mislead the addressee or recipient about the origin of such messages shall be punished with 3 years of imprisonment or and fine now there are basically offenses of two types one is cognizable the other is non cognizable most of you would be knowing about it some of them won't be and for the sake of for them to having a better appreciation of what exactly now i just give you an example if you are going on the street down and a couple of maybe two or three goons come in and they start bashing you very badly giving you lots of hitting you on your face and slapping you and even hitting you with a stick what are you going to do obviously you would go to the nearest police station saying that i am attacked now this is where the cops are going to say there is something called nc here i don't know why this nc thing exists at all so he will write down on the nc register 
saying that he has come out with a report stating that while walk, he was walking on the street, three goons came in and he hammered them very badly. He was bashed up very badly. And he says, typical, that means he has been told that he may go and resolve his grievance from the court. Now this is a concept of a non-cognizable offence. Non-cognizable offence is that offence where police have got no powers to investigate. Under the law, 323 Indian Penal Code says, if somebody causes voluntarily, voluntarily means hitting with the intention of hitting. If somebody causes, voluntarily causes hurt to someone, it would be uh, an offence of hurt which is a non-cognizable offence where police cannot take action. But the same hurt, if the magnitude of the hurt is lesser, but if it has been caused by a dangerous weapon, if he uses a knife or a blade to attack, that is 324, and that becomes a police case, that becomes a cognizable case. Now, cognizable and non-cognizable I repeat, non-cognizable is that case where police cannot take action. You have to directly file a case in the court. Cognizable case is the one where police lodges FIR. And what is the significance of FIR? FIR is a statutory document registered under 154 of the Code of Criminal Procedure. And the moment an FIR is registered, police get powers of investigation. Now, how investigation means to find the truth, to dig out what is hidden. Now, the power of investigation, there are three, four basic powers. First is the power of arrest. He can be arrested, put behind bars, says I am arresting him to interrogate him, number one. Or number two, he may run away and he will not be available for investigation. And uh, another reason for arrest is that we interrogate him so that Whatever incriminating evidence he has hidden, those evidence can be unearthed. Now this is, uh, the, this is the first power of investigation. The next power is he can raid, search, seize. He can issue summons to call the witnesses. Of course, uh, some things, certain things you don't understand because the power of summons by the police in the Court of Criminal Procedure, you can summon a witness only of that local police station area and the police station area around. That is mentioned in black and white in the Code of Criminal Procedure. And yet, we see that Delhi Police is summoning Subhash Chandra, the head of Z. Now, I fail to understand because I have got so many summons quashed myself. Somebody, an offence is registered in Borivali and a guy stays in Kolaba. The Borivali police station says, Summons under 160, you come and appear before me, whereas there is a case under investigation. And we have said, how? You can only call a person if he resides in Borivali or at best in the peripheral police stations like Kandivili or Daisar. How can you call a person from Kolaba? And this is the law. Then he said, no, sorry, sorry, by mistake we did it and we cancelled the summons. Now, if it's so flagrant violation of law, we are saying Delhi police is summoning the head of Z group, SL group, Subhash Chandra, he said, come to Delhi. Because till the time he is not arrested, he is a witness. After he is arrested, he can be straight away picked up and taken up and arrested. So, these are the powers which police gets consequent upon registering of the FIR. Now, in Information Technology Act doesn't say whether an offence is cognizable or non-cognizable. It is silent about it. Except Section 69 talks of certain conditions where it is cognizable. But whether it is cognizable or not, we have to draw certain principles, uh, certain stipulations set in the Code of Criminal Procedure, which says if an offence, because Code of Criminal Procedure says if the enactment by itself provides certain things which are contrary to the code, the provisions of that special enactment shall prevail. But if nothing is mentioned in that, you have to draw the stipulation set in the Code of Criminal Procedure. This is what Section 3 says of the code. Now, 
Schedule 1 2 of the Code of Criminal Procedure says that if an offense under a special or local act, special act is Information Technology Act or Income Tax Act, Customs Act, Essential Commodities Act, uh, Bombay Police Act. Bombay Police Act is a local act. These are the special acts. Local acts are Bombay Police Act or Maharashtra Regional Town Planning Act or so many Maharashtra Sales Tax Act. These are the enactments done by the state government, Maharashtra government. Now it says that if the punishment provided is three years or more, the offense is cognizable and non bailable Now there is a special procedure which says under 69 of the Information Technology Act that offenses where punishment is up to three years, they shall be bailable. That means this is the extent it modifies the Code of Criminal Procedure. Otherwise, it says that the offenses are cognizable and if it's more than three years imprisonment, the offenses shall be non bailable Now, that is how 66A becomes a cognizable offense because the punishment provided is three years. Now, three years is a punishment which makes an offence cognizable and uh, it is of course a bailable uh, offence. There is a difference between bailable and non-bailable. In both the provisions you are entitled to bail. But bailable offence is the one where bail is a matter of right. Because the moment you say that this is a bailable offence and here's a solvent surety, he is ready to provide surety the police officer at the police station, the moment he arrests him, he has no option but to release him on bail. And if he doesn't release him on bail, you have the option of even slapping section 342 of the code of, uh, of the Indian Penal Code, that is wrongful confinement. So, uh, but then police, now the things that the law has become so bad that it is governed not by reason but by passion. If any serious incident happens, there is a passion for oh, the laws have to be strong and unless until there is a strong law, they can never be a deterrent. Well, I think we dig our own graves because the moment we demand for tougher laws, we are giving more powers to the cop who has got immunity from being corrupt because he has paid his bosses for his posting. And you like an innocent person, you say, Thanedar or this senior PI is corrupt. Okay, I will tell his boss, little knowing that maybe a little while back a packet this guy must have given to his boss and then he gives it to his boss because in police there are two types of earnings. Primarily it turns to the packet system where the seniors give unbridled authority to the juniors to earn money provided they share their spoils with the seniors. <coughs> This is the safest method of practicing corruption because here it's a win-win situation for everyone. The junior guy, if he earns money, the senior is going to protect him. The senior guy doesn't have to do the dirty business of uh, going to thousands and hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of ladies bar, prostitution dens, pick up joints to collect the hafta. They won't. The guy who collected and this is the share and how it distributes. Now. We are giving power, draconian power, through the and giving him an enormous discretion to whom? To an evil entity. Because he is, he is just not, if he's a criminal, it's fine. Why I titled my book Carnage by Angels? Because cops are supposed to be angels. We go to the cops at the time of distress, when we are at our low. At that time, we go to them for succor look at him as an angel but when that angel doesn't indulge doesn't do his duty and instead indulges in corruption then ultimately it causes miseries among the masses but for instance a drugs cartel is being promoted by local cops by taking haftas just imagine a child who's taking drugs what would happen to his father so this is what has happened and that is how during various times, 66A was added later in the Information Technology Act. Now, unfortunately, in India, we also have certain interpretations of statutes which are to be done by the courts. And one of the principles for 
um, interpretation of statutes is that if the law speaks certain things, if the law speaks certain things, you are not there to apply your mind on the law. Because if a discretion is given on the implementing authority to apply the mind on the law, because I always say as a lawyer, I say my concern is not what laws is, uh, my concern is not what law should be, my concern is what law actually is. Because as a cop, if a poor guy, his son is dying of hunger, he robs 500 rupees from the house of a black marketeer of the local area, he is perfectly justified. But then as a statutory authority, implementing the Indian Penal Code, I am committed to registering an FIR on that, though I don't like it. Because I can't interpret the law the way I feel like. So, courts interpret the law and uh, 66A, there have not been many court rulings on this. But one interesting ruling which I saw was that uh, there was a company which was being maligned by a disgruntled person and he was saying your products are substandard and when that company came out with certain advertisement saying that people should buy the product of that company this person started sending emails all around that the product of this company is not good now uh, so this company complained against that nettlesome character who was sending vexatious mails and an FIR was registered against him under section 66A. Now the High Court ruling when it came to quashing of the FIR because High Courts have got powers to quash the FIR under 482 of the Code of Criminal Procedure to prevent miscarriage of justice. So the High Court observed the petitioners are sending these messages to the purchasers of cranes from the company and those purchasers cannot be considered to be possible buyers of the company. Sending of such emails therefore is not promoting the sale of the company which is the purpose of the advertisement given in the Economic Times. Such advertisements are therefore for the purpose of causing annoyance or inconvenience to the company or to deceive or mislead the addressee about the origin of such messages. These facts therefore clearly bring the acts of the petitioners within the purview of section 66A of the Act. Now, clearly the High Court went against the victim. If he says that, okay, your products are bad, now what would recourse is available under the common law? Because this is the basic conflict. It is so anomalous, this uh, proposition, that if he is saying my product is bad, actually it's good, the law which is specific to this for the company is to file a case of defamation under 499 of the Indian Penal Code. That also, there are so many exceptions because the law on defamation is so wide and it has got such liberal interpretations and stipulations that anybody if he is reasonably well-meaning and if he says something wrong about the other guy, there is the reasonable chances that he would be outside the purview of defamation. Because freedom of speech and expression is the core of Indian constitution, of any liberal constitution. And in the US constitution, the, it is so sacrosanct, freedom of speech and expression, that it is impossible for the legislature, for the government, for the uh, for the Congress to make a law even on pornography. They can't make a law. We have playboys and so many things happening in US. Why they can't make a law on obscenity? Because the US Constitution clearly said that you cannot make a law which restrains freedom of speech and expression. So, we have the law of defamation. If you want to do certain things, you sue him. But then law of defamation has large number of exceptions and one of the basic pillars of law of defamation is that truth is a defense. So if I say a particular person is uh, bad and he's actually bad and you can prove that he's bad and I pronounce it accordingly, publish it accordingly, it is not an offense. But if the same words 
same set of circumstances, if I publish in only a newspaper, if I write a letter, distribute a pamphlet on the street, it's not an offense. But the same set of circumstances, if I transmit it through my mobile phone or through a group email message, or uh, if I put it in, a, in my blog or in my website, in that case it is considered to be 66A. Now this is something extremely ridiculous, it is inconsistent. Similarly, for instance, pornographic material. If a person sells the pornographic material on the street, 292 Indian Penal Code, six months imprisonment only to the seller. But if an innocent person in the net, if he gets, like, I think everybody would have got some sort of obscene message, either in his cell phone or uh, in his email, because sometimes we don't get those things, sometimes we don't want it also, yet it comes in like a pop up in your computer. So, now of course, early, I think five, six years back, there was no control over that, and it would be so embarrassing to see certain images suddenly coming trying to come go to a website and the children are moving around but now of course the privacy settings have become much better now those things don't come up as they used to come up in 2003-2004 now if the same thing happens they say okay you are uh, guilty of uh, you are accused of uh, spreading uh, messages on the uh, on the net which is an obscene message and accordingly you can be hauled up for uh, the uh, for under the Information Technology Act, and uh, as far as for uh, um, there is a section 67A which says that you cannot transmit any sexually explicit material. <coughs> so, here the punishment prescribed is five years. That means if your computer has got any obscene photograph or somebody has sent you an SMS and which is there or it's an email which is there and if it's detected and if you have forwarded it to someone by mistake or even as a, good, as, as a friend the punishment would be 5 years imprisonment which makes it cognizable and non bailable offence fortunately this much of implementation in the law is not happening because of lots of constraints which exist within the police. Police, as it is, we have an enormous shortage of cops. Whatever cops are there, they are busy in more lucrative domains where there is no hassle. If a guy, you arrest him and you say, well, go Karnao and you say, this much of money I want, there will be hassles, there will be complaints, sting operation, there is that. But at the same thing, if you say, okay, uh, a rape party joined in Juhu, you give me so much of money, there will be no complaints. Nobody is going to complain, everybody would be happy because that would be collusive corruption. So, uh, this is what, now coming back to 66A, 66A by itself doesn't really, is a, generally what happens is that police doesn't apply 66A independently as a solo requires to have an accompaniment. Accompaniment generally what happens is that they add some section of the Indian Penal Code. Unfortunately in India, Indian Penal Code is as bad as 66A <coughs> because there are lots of restraints which have been imposed on freedom of speech and expression because of a colonial past and of course because of the divide and rule policy which was played by the Britain in order to sustain the British Raj in the country and that is the reason why there have been lots of such uh, stuff in the Indian Penal Code which was drafted in 1960 by Lord Macaulay, so called intellectual who brought modern education system also in India but at the same time uh, he made certain laws which would sustain the British rule, perpetuate the British rule. Now, one of the most uh, controversial sections which we saw was sedition. Sedition was made on this Asim Trivedi case. Now, if verbs of sedition, now 66A, they generally, in order to be on the safer side, they try to insert a section of the Indian Penal Code along with it. Like in this case of Palgar, first they put in 295A, 
that is her speaking something to her, the religious sentiments. And then 505.2, when they saw that Shiv Sena is not a religious entity, they put in 5052, is to annoy her group. Generally 5052 is used in very fragile communal situations when riots are going on and people are spreading rumors. Oh, about 500 people have come from the other side in 10 buses and they have parked the buses outside and they have come with equipped with swords and knives. And such rumors when they spread, spread it is generally used for that. So this is uh, uh, 124 is sedition they are good, but fortunately sedition is an old law where Supreme Court has come out with us so many judgments which have liberalized the sedition law quite substantially. Generally cops don't use it unless until they have some sort of an experienced reason to do so. About the Singh Trivedi case also internally we got to know that the cops were not very interested in slapping this section on him. But he was a very arrogant person and he annoyed the cops in a very emotional manner. He started abusing that this is what I heard, it may be wrong, but this is what I heard internally from the cops. He started rupturing the internal pride of the cops around and then they say, okay, you are acting smart, then we'll show you the place where you have to go. Now this is where sedition section is one thing. Then. Uh, Section 153 is there, somebody speaking those words which can cause a riot. Now riot again is subject to wide interpretation. Like uh, recently, academically, just from the academic sense, we have been seeing this case of... Uh, just to know like how cops manage the case of the rich guys. You must have heard of this Saif and Karina and all these people they fought with a South African national and broke his nose. So the police played a very cunning trick in this. They had to make the offence compoundable because generally criminal offences cannot be compromised as a rule. Criminal offences are not offences between two people. The criminal offence is one set is the victim, the other set is the state. Because to hit someone with a criminal intent, to commit a crime a, and a criminal act is you are attacking the state. That's why in criminal offences, the lawyer is of the state, that is the police, when the trial goes on. Now in the Salman Khan case, the case is not between Salman Khan and the people who died. It is between Salman Khan and the state, that is the cops, and the public prosecutor conducts the case. Now here, uh, since the cases cannot be compromised, so they played a trick. Now, under the definition of riot, if five or more people commit an illegal act with certain sections which includes uh, hitting someone, then it becomes an offence of riot. Now, in the Saif Ali Khan case, there were seven people, I believe. And police registered the case. Now, under the riot, there is one more section, 149 and even 34, which says, if in a group of people, one person commits a violence, then all the people in the group will consider to be his accomplice. They will be guilty of the offence. Now this is what is the principle which was derived. And there is another analogous section 34, which also says the same. If a group of people are committing an offence, if, even if one person commits the offence, the entire group is considered to be liable. So what the cops did, there were one plus six people. One was Saf and I think two guys and uh, four females, if I'm not wrong. Karina and Sang Malaika or some, some all such things were there. So what the cops did, they registered the case of one plus two. Now this is how the tricks they play. One plus two. Now they have recognized because hitting was done only by Saf. Nobody else did the hitting. So if it's one plus two, then why not 1 plus 6? Because 1 plus 2, there are certain offences which can be compromised, which are milder offences. 1 plus 2 was a milder offence, which can be compromised later on in the court. So they applied 1 plus 2. But under the law, they were supposed to apply 1 plus 6, because the entire group is considered to be liable. And if you are putting the entire group as being liable, how are you selecting two people out of those six people? Because all six people did the same acts. They did the same acts. 
the person who punched was Seth. All others were his friends around. So these are lots of games which are played. So if Seth, somebody says something, chalo Seth ko, you know, badmashi kiya, chalo isko maro tum ko. So then he will become guilty of 153, you know. Now 153 is again promoting enmity between classes. So if you speak something, you give a hate speech, roughly. A hate speech comes in this category. And if you are giving certain speeches which undermine the national integrity or national honor, that is 153B. Then the next section is, which was applied in this case, was 295A. 294 is another interesting section. <laughs> it's another. Now it says, here again, I think uh, that case is on Abai's pursuit case a little bit. It's uh, we have uh, just we always keep on doing certain legal experimentation only to gain knowledge because the more knowledge and experience you have, if you have an application of mind in certain situations, your interpretation of law uh, becomes much better. This is what uh, we have been doing for quite some time, and that is how we were able to push through so many large number of cases. Like we did the Adarsh case, we did the Lavasa, we have done the, we got an FIR registered against Hiranandani and the Urban Development Secretary. So many now, Abha has taken up some cases. Uh, Salman Khanji got him summoned for 27th, 27 December. He <laughs> just filed a legal experimentation case because a lot of people say, oh, you are doing a case for what? I said, I am doing it to gain knowledge. Instead of reading a book, might as well do a case. I will learn more. So that's what I told her and I think she was very amenable to my advices. We did a case for Indrani also we did a case for a small, small case for getting the Chopati stuff shut down quite substantially that beach, Chopati beach. She was very helpful with us. That's that small Choti Chopati, there's a restaurant there. So we keep on doing. So uh, now 294 is another interesting stuff. Um, because whenever we see that cops have really faltered, now because when you know the big money has exchanged, now 294 says if you abuse in public, if you give dirty abuses in public, it's a cognizable case where FIR should be registered. Now you all must be knowing the one period brawl of Shah Rukh Khan. So there he spoke dirty words before children, which is also an offence under the Children's Act. And uh, police, there is a circular, if anybody is drunk and there is a complaint against him, he should immediately send for a medical. They didn't do medical, he abused badly, the tape was there, the audio tape is thus there. I believe CCTV recordings were there, but they registered an NC. Now, similar case, there was another case which came to me, to somebody abused, and I told the guy, drafted the complaint and an FIR was registered, by hurling similar abuses dirty abuses. Now here again we have two sets of circumstances. At one place a person has, it was, that was case was registered in the Bombay Central Police Station and uh, it was, the builder had sent some people and uh, he wanted to get the guy vacated from the job so that he could demolish the building and construct his own building, redevelopment, all frauds you all must be knowing. So there when he abused I told I, that that person filed a complaint and 294 was registered. Now the same worse abuses in more difficult skin, worse circumstances was heard by Shah Rukh Khan which audio recordings are available on the internet. And uh, so of course uh, we didn't have that much of time to go to the court and all. We lost a complaint with the child commission. And now the Child Commission has requisitioned the records from the Indian Express, the original audio recordings. Because dirty words were beat by them for the fear of 67A or something of the Information Technology Act. So the abuses were beat, the clean recording. So this is how police misuses their powers. Because here Shah Rukh Khan, he must have paid, we don't know, but certainly the guy who dances for a night and gets a couple of crores. To get out of it, naturally, the police cannot be so uh, generous for such a rich guy. So, whatever it is, the case was then, 295A is one section, deliberate and malicious acts intended to outrage 
religious feelings of any class by insulting its religion or religious beliefs. This was initially applied on uh, the Balga girls, which was found to be erroneous. Like, uh, I don't know how Hindi movies we keep on seeing that they insult uh, Hindu gods time and again. Somebody will make fun of this god and that god and they will do some mimicry and all. Uh, we don't register. But uh, there's a person uh, who uh, spoke against rationalism. There was a case in Bakula for the cross Christian, he was a Catholic or something. And there was some, I think some milk was coming, something was there, some <laughs> irrational. Water. Huh? Water. Water. Water was coming out or something. And he said, no, no, this is irrational. Water is not coming out. Like, you remember once long back, Dhanpati, they said milk is coming out. Now, if everybody is saying milk is coming out, you say milk is not coming out. They will slap uh, uh, 295 a So, uh, this is what happens. This is another case which is really, really feel bad about it. That the person was jailed just because he was propagating rationalism. Any person with a rational mind knows that they can, there is no such magic. But then the cops registered a case and I think Carol is, must be knowing more about it. <laughs> so, uh, then uh, and these are the words. Then of course, according to me, there should be, before I come to that section, uh, 503 is again criminal intimidation. Here again police misuse the law and uh, it is open to anybody's uh, misinterpretation. Uh, like for instance, uh, uh, we have been seeing following this case against the ZTV chairman. Now the law clearly says that if you threaten someone and ask for money, that is if Chota Shakil or Chota Rajan threatens a builder, I'll kill you otherwise you give me money. And he takes the money, that is extortion. But if the builder himself, when he's starting the project, he goes before Chota Shakil, Saab apni kripa bana ke rakhega or he goes to Amar Nayak Vairiman, kripa bana ke rakhega ye dakshina rakhi je. This is not an offense of extortion. Now, the law, how it is it interpreted? Now, here the complainant was Jinder, Naveen Jinder, a rich guy. Rich guy, he offered Z 100 crores. Z never asked for it. He says, take 100 crores, spare us from adverse news. The Z guy said, okay, you give us 100 crores, we won't say anything against you. Now, this is the ingredient of the offense. Now, but then the law doesn't operate this way. Because Z never went to them. It is they who came to solicit the grace of Z. So, but then again, here the powerful guy was there. And unfortunately, our courts are also not so bold as they are supposed to be. If a person is arrested in a cognizable offence, the magistrate will not even look at the paper. He'll say, okay, available, non-available. Non-available. Three days police custody. This is all what happens and nobody protects the human rights of people. So, uh, then of course the next section is 5.5, which says statements conducting, uh, conduct, Whoever makes, punishes, circulates any statement, rumor, or report, which is uh, the relevant section, is it? With intent to incite or which is likely to incite any class or community or persons to commit any offense against any other class or community. Or not, or fear or alarm. Now, all these, now these are again very, very diff, uh, wide words with wide meanings. And uh, accordingly, uh, this uh, Facebook case was done. And lastly, I come to the provisions of defamation because according to me, to restrict speech, freedom of speech and expression, there should be only one law and that is defamation. Defamation are of two types, civil and criminal. Civil and criminal, both prosecutions can go at the same time, simultaneously, because they are not substitute of each other. Because criminal law, only one case and one prosecution. Because under the constitution of India, nobody can be punished for the same offense for more than one, one time. 
So consistent with that, there is a provision under 300 of the CRPC and section 26 also of the General Clauses Act, where a person can be punished for an offence, he can be prosecuted maybe in one or more courts, but he can be punished only once by one court and generally they club the cases. So uh, defamation are of two types, civil and criminal, as I said. Criminal only one case, but civil is not a substitute to criminal. Civil proceeding because in a very layman's term, I just give you how to explain this concept, it's slightly complicated concept, but I'll give you a very intelligible uh, way of explaining it. Let's suppose you have a maid servant in the house. She steals maybe 5,000 rupees from the safe. Now there are three actions which will go at the same time. First, you will lodge a police complaint saying that the maid servant has stolen 5,000 rupees. Police will register the FIR, arrest the girl, may woman, may not arrest the woman, but they will investigate the case, arrest and then prosecute and the case will go on in the court. The second would be a civil compensation. Okay, you have stolen 500 rupees, 5,000 rupees. I file a case, she has already spent it, let's suppose, and the money is not recovered by the cops. I will file a case to attach your property so that my 5,000 rupees plus my damages and legal costs, they come back to me. This is civil action. And the third is administrative action. Means I am going to throw her out of the job. Because if she has worked in my place, I am not going to keep on. Now this is where how it has to work in a statutory uh, domain in an analogous manner. If a statutory authority has done a wrong, first he is liable for criminal action then he is liable for compensation, third, he should be kicked out of the job. Now this is how the concept operates. So defamation is one thing according to me, that alone law should be there. If somebody has been maligned, because defamation is as bad as hitting a person if it is done in a wrong manner. Because somebody is wrongly accused of certain things, the person may even commit suicide, like we happened, it was of course for a different reason, but something akin, we happened in the nurse's case in uh, with the princess. Uh, she found that she has been humiliated and defamed and, and in her honor has got undermined, she committed suicide. So defamation is certain, but defamation is a non-cognizable offense. Criminal defamation, you have to file directly in the court. Summons by the court, issue of processes by the court, doesn't come easily. The judge first examines whether there is a material or not. Once he is satisfied that there is material, he will issue summons to call the accused. And uh, the person who is making the complaint, he has to be present in the court because he is the complainant. And under the Code of Criminal Procedure, for a, it's a non-cognizable offence. Police can't register the case. So uh, defamation is one thing and then certain people file civil cases. They take compensation, 100 crore compensation, 10 crore compensation. So according to me, there only has to be one law and 66A and all other laws which are there which are undermining our uh, freedom, individual freedom, civil liberties, human rights, they have to be done away with. So, we can go ahead with the questions. Thank you very much.